Hello, my GC co creators. Lilu here. I'm in, uh, not Amsterdam. This is my next destination actually tonight. For now, I'm in Dorn in the forest with you, Rupert. Thank you. Hi, Lilu. Very nice to be with you. Thank you for having the time to do this interview in this Pleasure. busy conference here happening in Dorn this year, uh, the non duality conference. You're, you're, uh, I love, I would really love to speak about your story because you're this ceramic artist. And you were this artist, and now you travel the world talking of non-duality. I used to be a ceramic artist before I started traveling the world speaking of non-duality. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so um, w let's start with what is your, uh, how do you define non-duality? Let's start there so that we're on the same page. What is it? Non-duality is the experiential understanding that our experience is not essentially divided into two parts. One part in here, the self, the separate self that knows, and another part out there, the object, the person, the world, that is known. Mm -hmm. This is the normal way we think. I in here mm -hmm. know or perceive you or it out there. And these, this is the way our experience is normally defined in our culture, these two essential ingredients, yeah. the inside self and the outside world. And so non-duality, the phrase non-duality, refers to the, uh, not just the understanding, but to the experience that, that experience is not divided into these two parts. It is one whole, mm. not made of two separated parts. It a self yeah. and another, a me and a you. So as you were, when you were an artist, I guess you have those moments and I guess artists have those moments of total communion and union. Is that what we're talking about here? Yes. Um, most artists are either looking for this, um, the essential nature of experience and are trying to express it and explore it mm -hmm. in their work or they have had a a deep realization of this and they are trying to create something that evokes this experience in a way that uh, to create an object or a piece of music or a painting or something that evokes this experience or or precipitates this experience in people's actual lives mm -hmm. Cezanne is the is the mm -hmm. great example of this he, he said this wonderful thing he was standing in front of uh, a mountain and he said in the south of France in the south of France Mont Saint Victoire he said uh, everything vanishes falls apart doesn't it nature is always the same and yet nothing in her that appears to us lasts our art must render the thrill of her permanence along with her elements the appearance of all her changes it must give us the taste of nature's eternity so here he is, standing in front of this mountain, this rock-solid, you know, the most enduring, solid, concrete object in nature. This been here for millions of years. And he says, everything vanishes, falls apart. What did he mean, everything vanishes, falls apart? He meant, all, all I know of the mountain is perception. This perception. I close my eyes, the perception vanishes. I turn my head, the perception vanishes. Then another perception, it vanishes. All we know of the world are perceptions, sights, sounds, tastes, textures and smells. That's it. That's all we know of the world. So he was saying everything vanishes. The, the apparently solid world is not solid. It falls apart in our actual experience. It comes and goes. Mm -hmm. But then he says, he kind of contradicts himself. Nature is always the same. And yet nothing in her that appears to us lasts. What, what does he mean? Nothing that appears lasts. And yet nature is always the same. And it's true. When we walk in nature, when, we, or when we're not just in nature, but our experience, there is something that is always the same. What is that? Mm. Everything that appears disappears. And yet there is something that runs through it. What is that? And then he says, our art must render the thrill of, of her permanence, of the thrill of the, the delight, it must, it must deliver the delight of that which runs throughout nature, that which is always the same. It must give us the thrill of her permanence along with her elements, the appearance of all her changes. So what he's saying is the artist must take, in his case it was colours, in a musician's case it's, it's sounds, notes. An artist takes all these elements and arranges them in such a way as to evoke in our actual experience, not just to give us the idea, 
but to evoke in our actual experience what is always the same. He says, it must give us the taste of nature's eternity, that which is ever-present, not eternity. He didn't mean lasting forever. He meant that which is eternally present now. Our, our art must give us the taste of nature's eternity. But could, can we say that uh, through creating art, we're thinking of all those aspects? Isn't it happening natu naturally through being in the present moment? All of that coexists. I am, I'm just uh, um, articulating yeah. what, for the most part, is, is not being rationalized. Yeah. And certainly the artist may or may not rationalize this before or after yeah. the creativity. But in the moment, yeah. you're not thinking of this. Cezanne wasn't thinking this. Yeah. This is him reflecting on his, his yeah. work. And an artist or a sports person, for instance, is not thinking. that There's no time yeah. for thinking if you're totally, as an artist, if you're uh, any musician knows this, or, or, or a painter or a sculptor or, or a writer or a poet, as well as a, a sports player, there's no time for thought in the moment. Yeah. And as an artist, you're trying to create something that evokes not what seems to be there, not the appearances, but, but what is truly the, the, the substance, the reality of our experience. And that reality, whatever our experience is really made of, it doesn't come and go. Uh -huh. It wasn't born, it's not evolving, and it's not going to disappear. And the reality... The, the, the essential substance of what we experience out there is identical to our own reality. What I essentially am yeah. is what it essentially is. The, in other words, it is not self yeah. and other. We share one being, uh -huh. one presence, one reality. And the common name for this experience is love. Uh -huh. That's what we mean when we, you know, when we fall in love. We, we we even even in uh, even in conventional language when, when you fall in love or when you love someone you feel that you somehow you merge with them you you melt into each other you th that is the the dissolution of being a separate self here i the separate well defined self here and you the separate well defined self there that the experience of love is the dissolution of these two entities the realization of our shared being so in relation to another we call it love in other words love is the discovery that others are not really others exactly the same discovery in relation to objects is called beauty when we're walking in nature or when we listen to a piece of music or we see a work of art the ex the experience of beauty is the dissolution of the sense of me and it in other words Love is the discovery, the, the revelation that others are not others. Beauty is the revelation or the discovery that objects are not really objects. They're not out there made of stuff called dead, inert matter. They are all we know of, of the so-called world is the knowing of it. And that knowing of it is totally alive, that there is no dead matter in our experience. Dead matter is a, a concept that the Greeks invented a few thousand years ago, but scientists are still looking for it. The, the, nobody's ever found this stuff called dead matter in the universe. All we know is experience, and experience is totally alive with the knowing of it. Mm. So that is what non-duality... I'm articulating something that that is not necessary to articulate. It's It's a living experience, and it's what is known as love it's what is known as beauty it's what is known as happiness mm -hmm. because we we can see um there's those really beautiful places some people that are more spiritually in tune with with would talk about energies and auras and and fields whereas somebody even that is just just from the beauty perspective we could sense that it just awakens something in us it it Yes. It's it's sometimes it's not always seen at this. What I'm trying to say is that it's not it's not always uh, experienced or seen in the same way by the eyes of the observer. But the effect of beauty and that harmony definitely affects us, and we can interpret it in many different forms because some people see the invisible, and some others don't. Yes. But the effect yes. is very calming, centering, loving. Yes, it's true. If we If you, for instance, you go into a building, you walk into a building, and the building has been designed from 
this under, this from this feeling understanding that I speak of. Now, whether the architect or the designer rationalized it in the way I'm doing so is not important. Mm -hmm. Most probably wouldn't. But nevertheless, if if the design and the building uh, uh, of of this uh, uh, of this structure of this building came from from the intuition or the experience that, that I'm referring to, then this intuition or experience informs what we make. Mm -hmm. It somehow yeah. goes into the make of it. Okay. And then and that is the way this understanding communicates itself. It literally it takes the form yeah. of what we make. So then when somebody walks into mm -hmm. such a building, they they may not have any of these thoughts. In fact it's best not to think about it because it's not about concepts. It's not a new idea. But you go into such a building or you listen to a piece of music that has come from this understanding or from an intuition of it or you you see a painting that has come from it and and you stand in front of it and somehow your 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 mind your your mind falls away sometimes you you get goose pimples or you find that you're weeping for no reason or you you just that there is this tremendous opening and relaxation in the body you don't know why you don't have to know why mm. but what is being it's a communication that the the object is somehow leading you to to what says I'm called that which is to to nature's eternity mm -hmm. to that which is ever present in our experience which is identical with what we essentially are which is awareness hi we have a visit from a friend hi buddy <laughs> <laughs> beautiful yes I, are you finding that uh, what are the things that um, that can release this uh, f flow that can help artists to be more in tune with that aspect and us also as artists I believe we're artists in our own rights all of us in life is there some uh, things that you also teach to help being more in the intimacy of the moment or it's all just an experimentation that the, there are there are things there are lines of investigation or exploration that we can undertake to to make what I am suggesting here as a possibility an actual reality in our lives and the first thing to do is to explore what we are what I am mm -hmm. everybody knows that that I am that I am present and that the I that I am is is aware for instance right now you are aware of this conversation and we are aware of the sound of the birds and the sight of the trees and the tingling of the sensations you, mm -hmm. of your feet and and whatever thoughts are present in your mind we're all aware of this now what is it that is aware of that what is aware of your thoughts i've heard deepak chopra said this and i would don't, say the don't, soul don't, don't <laughs> no no don't refer to to what Anybody intellectually, else. yeah. No, it, but right it's now, my soul. It, no, d d d d because the soul is just... A, okay, but I'm just going to ask you what you mean by your soul. Because right now... My essence? No, y you, yeah? You, I, the one that is called Lilu. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. you are aware of your thoughts, mm -hmm. yes? Now, whatever it is that is aware of your thoughts is not itself made out of a thought, yes? Because the thought flies by... Yes, the thought is like this. Yes, it just sails by. What should we have for dinner tonight? It comes and it's gone. Some but get stuck longer. <laughs> some get stuck a bit longer and they go round and round. But nevertheless, they all go. But you are there, aware of that passing thought. Yeah. You weren't made of the thought because when the thought vanishes, you remain. Mm -hmm. Yes, same with your bodily sensations. All the sensations that are present in your body now, they disappear. But you, when they are present, you're aware of them. When they disappear, you remain. So you can't be made, you, this aware presence, is not made out of a sensation or a thought or a feeling mm. or a sound or a shape or a texture or a smell. Yeah? You are aware of all these things. Now, what is that you, that aware presence? If I was to ask you, for instance, turn your attention towards your thoughts. Take, take a thought now, any thought. What should we have for dinner? You don't have to tell us. Just any thought. And just watch the thought flow by. It's very easy to watch that thought. Yeah? It's like watching a bird. You just watch it. Yeah. Or if I was to suggest to you, turn your attention towards the tingling sensation at the soles of your feet. Mm -hmm. You go straight there. Very easy. Mm -hmm. Or to the sound of the birds. You go straight there. Now, what if I was to ask you, turn your attention to whatever it is that is aware of your thoughts, your feelings, 
your sensations and your perceptions. Where do you go? Inside. Inside where? More on the heart areas. Okay, so do you, what, what, what you find the heart area, what is it that is aware of the heart area? I would say my essence, my beingness. Whatever it is, can you find it? It's no, it's not definable, but it's, it's not definable or, or findable. Or findable. If, if if you go to your heart area, you find a sensation or a feeling, mm -hmm. but something in you knows that sensation or is aware of that sensation or feeling. If you try to find that one, you can't find it. Why? Because it's not an object. Mm -hmm. It's not a thought. It's not a feeling. It's not a sensation. It's just made out of pure, empty awareness. Mm -hmm. Empty because it's it's not made of an object. Yes. So it's just, it's like it's transparent. Mm -hmm. It's empty. It's made out of pure knowing, pure awareness. Now, if, if you ask yourself, is there a limit to that awareness? Can you find, go now. No, I cannot find, put boundaries. Can you find a limit to it? Does it have an age? Mm -mm. Does it have a gender? Mm -mm. So immediately, this that we call I, we're discovering, this I is not a, a, a 40, 50, 60, 60 year old man or woman. It's not um, white or black or, or... This eye is transparent, colorless, without boundaries, without limits, without gender, without age. And if we look deeply, in other words, it has no limits. And if we look deeply as well, we find that it is always present. Have you not always been present as the knower of your experience? The, the five-year-old Lilu, wasn't her experience known by the same transparent awareness... Yes, I was experiencing life differently, but yeah. yeah. No, the experiences were different. Mm -hmm. The thoughts were different. The feelings were different. The sensations were different. The world was different. But the one who experienced them, was that one different? Based on our conversation, no. No, it wasn't. It doesn't change. Because only an object could change. But this is just, th this I, this essential self, your being, is just made out of empty awareness. Mm -hmm. It's the same I that is, it's not growing older, it's not moving or changing, and it doesn't disappear. You've never had, nor could you ever have, the experience of this I disappearing. It wasn't born. It's not evolving. It's not going to die. Yes, the mind appears and disappears. The body appears and disappears. But you, the essential you, is without limits and ever-present. No. Without limits means infinite, not finite. And ever-present means eternal, eternally now. That is the great discovery to make, that what I am is not a cluster of thoughts, feelings and sensations that was born at a particular time and place that is moving, evolving, growing old and is one day going to disappear. This, what we essentially are, is this ever-present luminous, empty, transparent awareness, which which is intimately one with all appearances, mm -hmm. just like the screen is intimately one with the image that appears on it, but at the same time absolutely free of them. The, the, the screen is not stained by the, by the movie. You are not stained or hurt or harmed by any thought, by any activity, by any, by anything. Life can't hurt you. Mm -hmm. you. You are this pristine, indestructible, ever-present, infinite awareness, which is intimately one. The sounds, for instance, all we know of the sound is the experience of hearing, yes? All we know of sound is hearing. How close to you does the experience of hearing take place? 20 meters away or this close? Where is hearing taking place? How close to you? Well, I can hear the birds out, but uh, but it resonates as I... The experience of hearing, where is that taking place? That's a good question. Uh, the experience of hearing here, here. Here, yeah. here. here. Yeah. It, intimate, is, it, is it at a distance from yourself? No. Is there some space between yourself and hearing? No, none. Fact, can you even find two things there, myself and hearing? No. They're, they're, they're like this, yes? Thought says, I know the sound in here, but the sound is over there. Thought divides hearing into two parts. A self on the inside that hears, and a sound on the outside that is heard. That's duality. 
But if we stay close to our experience, to the intimacy of our experience, and we ask, what knowledge do I have of the sound of the birds? It's just the experience of hearing. And hearing is not divided in two, into a me part and a not me part, into a lilu part and a bird part. It's just hearing, one seamless, intimate substance. And seeing is the same. It's not divided into a seer in here and the seen world out there. It's all just seeing. And seeing is made out of the knowing of it. You are that knowing. You pervade the entire field of your experience. Nothing is separate from you. Yes, I love how you put it. It's so clear. Isn't <laughs> it juicy? Oh my goodness. Yes, but that's not at all how we were raised. <laughs> no, it's not how we were raised. It's the whole brain fights for it during not, a while and then it's it released. It's not how we were raised. We were we were raised, you know, I don't know what what you had when you when you were learnt to, when you learnt to read and write. We had these hardback books called David and Jane. David sees the tree. David loves Jane. David feels sad. A subject joined to an object through an act of knowing, perceiving, or feeling. This is the, uh, the fundamental presumption of our culture, a subject and an object that are essentially separate. But both are needed. It, that, that is a, it, it's fine to have the concept, but to believe uh, the concept of duality of a subject and an object, but to believe that this concept reflects the reality of our experience is a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. It is responsible if we go deeply into the causes of suffering. Mm -hmm. the co we always find that the belief that what we are is a separate self is the fundamental cause of all suffering in individuals. And that suffering, multiplied seven billion times, is responsible for the conflict, disharmony, the aggression that we find in the world today. So this, this and, and the reason why, after, in spite of all our attempts to find peace in ourselves, in our re intimate relationships, in our community and in the wider world, the reason why these conflicts persist is because we don't go to the root of them. And the root of all these conflicts is this one essential belief that what I am is a separate, limited, temporal self. Until that self is seen to be non-existent, the conflict will continue, both in ourselves and we will spread it around us in our relationships and in the wider community. Well, I was going to say, so the answer is love, but it's... Uh You're right, the answer is love, if as long as by love... Yeah, we mean we have the... We, we understand, yeah. not a... a, a um, not not a feeling from one person to another. The the what love is is the 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 dissolution of the sense of self and other. Mm. So yes, absolutely, love is the answer. Mm. Yes, you're absolutely right. Love is an is a. It's like the common name for non-duality. Mm. What I'm describing in a rational way is lived and felt in our experience as as love. It's also experienced as peace and happiness. These are the ways that, that this understanding is revealed in our actual experience. Love, peace and happiness. And think about it. If you were to stop, if you were to do a poll of all seven billion people and ask how many of them are interested in, how many of you are interested in non-duality? I mean, who would say yes? Hardly anyone. 0.0001% would say. But what about if you asked all 7 billion, are you interested in love and happiness? All 7 billion would say yes. What is this experience called love that everyone seeks? It is the dissolution of feeling that we are a fragment, that we are incomplete, that we are missing something, that we are needing something from another or from an object or from the world. Everybody longs for that sense of incompleteness to be dissolved. And why do we go for chocolates, cigarettes, drinks, activities, the next sexual encounter, whatever it is? What are we looking for? We're just longing to be complete again, to be whole again, for the feeling of 
fragmentation, separation, to, to dissolve. And these objects, they temporarily dissolve the sense of separation, but they don't truly uproot the sense of separation. So as soon as the chocolate or the alcohol or the relationship wears off, there is our longing again. Our, the seeking comes back and we go out again towards another object until it becomes clear to us that what we're seeking for is not an object or a state or a relationship. What we're longing for is to be healed of, of this. It's like a wound in the heart, th th this, this wound of separation. That's what everybody longs for. And the healing of that is called happiness. Thank you, Rupert. Thank you for this happiness moment. Thank you. This Thank was you. delightful. What a great Thank surprise. I loved it. Out here in the woods talking about these things. Where about do you live in, uh, in England? I live in Oxford. Oxford, I love it. I studied uh, in Oxford Brookes University. Oh, yes, I really enjoyed the city. Oh, I just okay. came back and stopped in Oxford on my way from Glastonbury when I was there for some interviews. Yeah. And Next time you're there, come and visit us. Yes. Yeah. Lovely, beautiful, beautiful city. Much love, my delicious co-creators from uh, Holland, from the woods here. And uh, thank you, Rupert. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>speaking of non-duality yes yeah. yes and so um let's start with what is your uh, how do you define non-duality let's start there so that we're on the same page what is it non-duality is the experiential understanding that our experience is not essentially divided into two parts one part in here the self the separate self that knows and another part out there the object the person the world that is known. Mm -hmm. This is the normal way we think. I in here mm -hmm. know or perceive you or it out there. And these, this is the way our experience is normally defined in our culture. These two essential ingredients, yeah. the inside self and the outside world. And so non-duality, the phrase non-duality mm -hmm. refers to the, uh, not just the understanding, but to the experience that, that experience is not divided into these two parts it is one whole mm. not made of two 
separated parts, a self and another, a me and... GC co-creators, Lilu here. I'm in, uh, not Amsterdam. This is my next destination actually tonight. For now, I'm in Dorn in the forest with you, Rupert. Thank you. Hi, Lilu. Very nice to be with you. Thank you for having the time to do this interview in this Pleasure. busy conference here happening in Dorn this year, uh, the Non-Duality Conference. You're, you're, uh, I love, I would really love to speak about your story because you're the ceramic artist and you were this artist, and now you travel the world talking of non-duality. I used to be a ceramic artist before I started traveling the world. Uh, everything vanishes, falls apart, doesn't it? Nature is always the same, and yet nothing in her that appears to us lasts. Our art must render the thrill of her permanence, along with her elements, the appearance of all her changes. It must give us the taste of nature's eternity. So here he is, standing in front of this mountain, this rock-solid, you know, the most enduring, solid, concrete object in nature. This been here for millions of years. And he says, everything vanishes, falls apart. What did he mean, everything vanishes, falls apart? He meant, all, all I know of the mountain is perception. This perception. I close my eyes, the perception vanishes. I turn my head, the perception vanishes. Then another perception, it vanishes. All we know of the world are perceptions, sights, sounds, tastes, textures and smells. That's it. That's all we know of the world. So he was saying everything vanishes. The, the apparently solid world is not solid. It falls apart. In our actual experience, it comes and goes. Mm -hmm. But then he says, he kind of contradicts himself. Nature is always the same. And yet nothing in her that appears to us lasts. What, what does he mean? Nothing that appears lasts. And yet nature is always the same. And it's true. When we walk in nature, when, we, or when we're not just in nature, but our experience, there is something that is always the same. What is that? Mm -hmm. Everything that appears disappears. And yet there is something that runs through it. What is that? And then he says, our art must render the thrill of, of her permanence, of the thrill of the, the delight, it must, it must deliver the delight of that which runs throughout nature, that which is always the same. It must give us the thrill of her permanence along with her elements, the appearance of all her changes. So what he's saying is the artist must take, in his case it was colors, in a musician's case it's, it's sounds, notes. An artist takes all these elements and arranges them in such a way as to evoke in our actual experience, not just to give us the idea but to evoke in our actual experience what is always the same. He says to you. Mm -hmm. So as you were, when you were an artist, I guess you have those moments, and I guess artists have those moments of total communion and union. Is that what we're talking about here? Yes. Um, most artists are either looking for this, um, the essential nature of experience, and are trying to express it and explore it mm -hmm. in their work, or they have had a, a deep realization of this, and they are trying to create something that evokes this experience in a way that, uh, to create an object or a piece of music or a painting or something that evokes this experience or, or precipitates this experience in people's actual lives. Mm -hmm. Cezanne is the is the mm. great example of this. He, he said this wonderful thing. He was standing in front of uh, a mountain, and he said, "In the south of France, in the south of France, Mont Saint Victoire." He said, 